Please join me in welcoming Professor Jenny Williams. Um, thanks so much, Jackie, and thanks, Don, for inviting me. I feel so um, privileged to be here today to be able to speak with you. I'm an economist, and frankly, there aren't that many who are, have the same interests um, as I do. Although, as, as, as you heard Jackie speak, I, there was a few, <laughs> my interests are spread um, beyond um, crime, but what basically puts uh, young people at risk of failing to thrive, to, to reach their full potential. Um, the people that I, I'm an economist and this is the first crime conference I've been to and um, as I look around the room there are some faces I know but they know me from my substance use research and it's to Don's credit that he ferrets out anyone with similar interest to his own in his pursuit, his intellectual curiosity in pursuit of, of um, ways and means of better understanding these issues. Um, so this work is uh, joint with my wonderful PhD student Shannon Ward who has demonstrated um, with myself and Jan van Roos what research can achieve. I love this paper. It's fresh off the press. We were <laughs> she was sending new results on Sunday and I'm rewriting my slides. Because to me, it incorporates incredibly rich data, which is a necessity for good quality research, um, good theory applied appropriately to the relevant data, careful, thoughtful, use of the data and ultimately uh, appropriate econometric techniques in order to identify causal effects because that's the end game. As an economist, we want to identify causal effects. Now, with people, they move, <laughs> they move around, so it's a bit hard to do experiments. And in this paper, we seek to identify the causal effect of engaging in delinquency and arrest on school-leaving behaviour. You're not going to be able to run a an experiment that allows you to <laughs> induce some people into delinquency and some people into arrest. So in the absence of being able to run an experiment, what we're left with is trying to identify using econometric techniques and the techniques that I'll use today are based on timing of events. We're looking at transitions and ordering of events are crucial for the identification strategy. So um, let, me, let me begin. I'm not sure where to, to, to look with my glasses on. Um, maybe I'll take them off. So, as you're all aware, this is a bit redundant for the audience at hand, but the net cost of crime is huge. In the US, it's about a trillion dollars a year. Not a small amount of this cost is attributable to incarcerating uh, 1.6 individuals in uh, adults in federal and state prisons and around 61,000 uh, uh, juveniles in residential placements. Of course, the costs extend way beyond that to the families and children left behind, not to mention, as an economist, for the foregone earnings of people who are incarcerated who could have been usefully employed. A huge amount of effort seeks to understand how this has come to be. And one of the um, very robust and resilient findings is that education is a common risk factor for ending up in prison as an adult. In the US, two out of three inmates have not graduated from high school. If you look at delinquents who, uh, who have been in um, uh, residential placements, most don't return to school upon release. And amongst those who do, um, they tend to leave school within 12 months. So that's sort of a correlational story. Economists have gone on to um, determine that, in fact, there's a causal relationship. Early school leaving causes criminality and incarceration in adulthood. But juxtapo juxtaposed to this, this literature is, so what this literature says is early school leaving, adult crime and incarceration. But juxtaposed with this very useful and insightful uh, literature is another literature which says, well, that adult crime, it started with juvenile delinquency and antisocial behaviour. So we have two strands of literature who, that are really useful uh, for understanding how people get uh, to be incarcerated in adulthood. One says leaving school early leads to adult incarceration. Another strand says early uh, delinquency and antisocial behaviour leads to um, incarceration in adulthood. So taken together, 
this body of evidence suggests, well, two things. One is that the, the pathway into adult crime and, and incarceration is, is dynamic. It depends on there's paths there that depend on previous decisions and outcomes of those decisions. And the other thing that is really obvious from the, when you look at these two literatures as a body is that choices made in youth regarding delinquency and school leaving are pivotal for adult outcomes. So we know that early school leaving leads to uh, adult crime and incarceration. We know that antisocial behaviour and delinquency in youth lead to adult incarceration and, and, and crime. But what we don't know terribly much about is the relationship between early school leaving and uh, youthful delinquency and antisocial behaviour. There is some research that looks at these, uh, but at youthful um, um, behaviours, but they tend to focus on interactions with the criminal justice system and how that affects school leaving, or they look at the effect of being incarcerated in school um, on, um, on contemporaneous arrest and reported crimes and prosecutions. And there's some really neat identification strategies in this literature looking at, you know, teacher uh, strikes or in-service days, so kids you know, would be at school um, in some areas but not in other areas because some teachers were striking and not others, for example. Or they have their in-service days in some schools on different days. So it gives this random variation as to whether children are physically in school or not. And they... So, but the, the great, they're great studies and they contribute a, a great insights and they show, you know, unsurprisingly, that they're being arrested and incarcerated leads to early school leaving and that if you're in school... And you, can't, and you can't go and uh, engage in crime, then the crime rates are lower. But this literature fails to recognise that... So they're focusing on interactions with the criminal justice system and, and how the relationship with criminal justice... Uh, or juvenile justice, I apologise, interactions and, and crime. They're focusing on that relationship. But they fail to, um, to kind of look at the big picture recognising that these interactions with the justice system don't arise by chance. They arise because these kids are engaging in delinquent behaviour. And the question is, does engaging in delinquent behaviour affect schooling decisions, um, or even, if you're, even in the absence of being arrested or incarcerated? I'm going to outline some theories that would suggest that, yes, that you would expect there would be some, some consequences. So that's sort of where this, the contribution of this paper lies. We're going to investigate whether and to what extent engaging in delinquency and being arrested in youth leads to early school leaving behaviour. And in order to identify causal effects, our approach is going to have to deal with common confounders that determine delinquency, arrest and school leaving. In addition, we have to address the potential for reverse causality where early school leaving might lead to uh, delinquency and arrest. So let me just sort of preview my results because I do understand this is the after lunch session and if you need to kind of rest your eyes, there's a few slides with maths that might not appeal to you so I can tell you that there's some, some good spots here to have a rest and let me just preview my uh, results in case you don't come back to us. All right. <laughs> I have lots of colleagues that doze in seminars so I'm not offended by it at all. <laughs> all right, so let me preview the results. What we do find that both... Arrest. So, arrest does uh, lead to early school leaving, so we verify what the literature finds. But over and above that, we also find that delinquency leads to early school leaving. The effect of arrest is a, in, in magnitude twice the effect of delinquency without arrest. So, arrest has a bigger effect than delinquency per se. Then what we do... Well, the order of the paper is a bit different but so, than I have in terms of up here right now. But what we're going to do is say, OK, but what's the societal effect? We, the effect of arrest on school leaving applies... If we apply that to the population of kids who are 17, for example, and still in school and being arrested, how does that affect their school leaving between age 17 and 18? And let's look at the proportion of kids who are uh, 17 in school engaged in delinquency and not being arrested. What's their impact on school leaving? And what we find is because the proportion of kids who have been arrested is, is only half and still in school, is only half of the proportion of kids who have been delinquent but not arrested and still in school, the net effect is that delinquency has the same societal impact as arrest in terms of school leaving. So it's one of those things where, you know, something has a bigger impact but applies to a smaller population. Um, and once you account for that, they, they are of similar magnitudes of importance. 
We also investigate the differential effects of different kinds of crime. We focus on income versus non-income generating crime, and I'll get specific with that in a moment. Uh, and we also look at age of onset um, into income and non-income generating crime uh, and look at uh, how that affects um, school leaving behaviour. And what we find, oh, it's meant to be, I'm meant to be previewing my results here. And what we find is that it's, that the effect on school leaving is being driven by income generating crime. Not assaults, not property damage. It's being generated by income generating crime. That's what leads to the early school leaving. We also find, which you're probably not surprised to hear, that um, the earlier that the onset of that income generating delinquency occurs, uh, the larger the effect in terms of school leaving. So uh, these, these, kind of, these are sort of consistent with what you'd predict with a, a model where um, people accumulate experience and that makes them more productive in an endeavour. And uh, that's sort of, so what we find is consistent with some predictions of uh, a model that I'm going to outline in just a minute. But let me just tell you where the rest of the talk is going. I'm going to, I'm going to start with the, the, just to outline a conceptual framework from economics, which is a human capital accumulation process. Uh, human capital, like, you know, physical capital is productive, human capital is productive. You usually think of human capital as education or experience that makes you better at your job. Similarly, with criminals, they gain experience and get better with, with, in their job. Uh, I'm going to talk at length about the data. I'm a data monkey. Data is everything to me. If, you know, you've got to have good data to do good work. Um, and this is based on the National Longitudinal Survey of Youth 1997. Um, uh, I'll talk about the empirical framework, which is where you might want to have a nap, the results and the sensitivity analysis. Um, but the, the conceptual uh, framework, this is just really quick. This is a human capital kind of framework where individuals allocate times to different activities. So they have resources. They have to decide where they're going to put their resources. The resource is time. And they allocate time in each period, so it's a uh, multi-period model, to maximise their expected lifetime's earnings. And you can generate earnings from crime or work. The decision to engage in crime, this is really critical, depends on the determinants of returns to crime. What determines returns to crime? Well, your capital stock in, in your experience, how good you are at doing it, and uh, your endowment of criminal uh, ability. Some people just are better at knowing how to do some stuff. Uh, so we, um, so um, when you engage in crime, you're building experience in, in criminal endeavours, which is going to improve your ability to generate income through that endeavour. So the idea is build, engaging in crime builds your criminal capital, which increases your expected future monetary returns. And then you're looking at education, you're making a trade-off. What do I think I can get if I stick with school and get a job? What do I think if I can leave school and just engage in crime in the future? And so early school leaving becomes a consequence of the falling expected relative returns to education. The model predicts that you're going to see a stronger effect in terms of income generating crime than property crime and it also uh, predicts you're going to get a stronger effect with earlier initiation because you have longer to get a payoff to your investment in that form of capital. So that's sort of the overall um, framework. You don't have to buy in the framework to look at the, the data and look at the results but that's, as an economist, that's where I'm coming from. Loud and proud, <laughs> here I am. All right, now here is amazing, beautiful data. And talk about nightmares of setting up data. It's a very complex data. Uh, we're using the National Longitudinal Survey of Youth 1997. It uh, interviews about 10,000 um, people. It started in 1997, uh, and where people were 12 to 18 at that point in time. They were interviewed annually. Uh, we used data up to 2009, round 13, where respondents were aged 24 to 30. And, um, um, you know, we've got... We've got four, four and a half thousand males in the sample. Need big sample sizes to be able to do what this sort of what this work entails. And it's it's longitudinal. I mean, they're followed every year. It's just amazing. Uh, the outcomes we focus on is age. So this is going to be about transitions. So we're, the outcomes we focus on are age at which respondent first leaves school, uh, and they have a number of measures of that. We're looking at the enrolment variable. Were you enrolled? Um, well, at 12 to 18, they can say, what, at what age did you leave school? If they're still in school, like they're 12 or 13, they're interviewed annually and they're um, determined whether, they've, whether they're currently enrolled at, at that uh, point of interview. Uh, of course, they adjust for whether it's the summer and no one's actually in school. Um, the age at first arrest is self-reported. Uh, 
they are asking the first wave, and similar with the, whether you've engaged in delinquent behaviour. I'm not using the word juvenile because they ask these questions after they become um, adults, but they, they self-report um, the age at which they uh, first engaged in delinquent behaviour or were first arrested. They're asked about the age it first occurred in the first wave. Subsequently, they're asked if it occurred since the last interview. Um, the income generating crimes uh, that they ask about, so there could be other things that people do, but these are the, what, what um, are asked on the survey. Stealing something worth $50 or more. Other property crimes which involve fencing and things like that. And selling drugs. The non-income generating uh, crimes are attacking someone, like being in a fight and destroying property. Bad boy behaviour. And I do just focus in ma on males in this analysis. Okay, so this is, oh, this is where I get excited because I like my data. Okay, so in terms of school leaving, we've seen about 95% you know, leaving school. Some people can leave the survey at like for age 15 and we don't observe them to leave school, but that's okay because I'm using a duration analysis. The duration until school leaving is just censored and that's all modelled. Uh, amongst those who leave school, the, the average age is about 19.5. They finish year 12 um, at 18 or 19. So this is just after finishing year 12. Um, 68% self-report being engaged in delinquency and the average age of onset amongst those is 13 years old. You'll notice 68% of engaged in delinquency, 62% uh, are doing the non-income generating delinquency and their average age of onset is 13. Um, they, these aren't mutually exclusive, they can do both, right? But we analyse them as, as uh, different activities. Income generating delinquency, 43% of engaged in, and the average age of onset is uh, 15. Uh, arrest, 44% have been arrested. Age of first arrest, uh, conditional upon being arrested, 17.4. It's already pretty clear from these data, the ordering of events. Non-income delinquency, fighting, you know, graffiti. Income generating delinquency, stealing stuff. Arrest. School leaving. So I'm going to show you lots of more pictures and, and tables that demonstrate that in the raw data. Oh, in terms of controls, it's a very rich data set. I have all, I have all kinds of stuff on their family, the number of older siblings, younger siblings, whether their parents are present, their parents' education. I have um, uh, an ability score, which we correct for their level of education. I know if their you know, pu early puberty predicts uh, delinquency. Um, whether they went to a private school, it's very, very rich uh, on characteristics. Having a teen mother, um, be, parents being very religious. Okay, now, this is a pretty hairy looking diagram. Breathe into it. I'm going to walk you through it because it's really important and if you get this diagram, you're going to take away some really important information. First of all, this line here, well these are transition, oh, transition, uh, Transition rates. What's a transition rate? It's the probability of changing states from like no delinquency to delinquency or being in school to leaving school or not arrested or arrested. It's the probability of changing states at a given age conditional on not having done so before. So we're looking at the first instant. We're looking at initiation into delinquency. We're looking at first school leaving. We're looking at uh, the first arrest. Right? And what you, so if we start with this this dotted line up top, this is looking at the transition rate. I should have done colour. Sorry, I'm an economist. I'm just <laughs> used to thinking in black and white. Uh, <laughs> um, so this line up top here is looking at the transition rate into delinquency. And what you can see is um, it kind of starts at age seven and has a little peak here at 14 and then starts going down. Um, this um, vertical little stripes here is arrest. So you can see there's a whole lot of um, onset of delinquency happening here before arrest occurs. So you've got delinquency and arrest. Well, that makes sense. No one's going to argue about that. And then way over here is when you get school leaving. So for sure, you've got to be fairly, just from a, you know, the data says delinquency, arrest, school leaving. But we can actually say a bit more. We can say the, the top dotted line just underneath the dashed line, that's your non-income generating delinquency, so you quite, see quite clearly participation into non, you know, that's fighting, graffiti, that's starting pretty early. Here's your income generating delinquency. It happens at a lower, uh, you know, the probability of making transition is much lower and really doesn't kick off until much later. 
And here's school leaving, or here's arrest and here's school leaving. So once again, the order of events is non-income generating delinquency, income generating delinquency, arrest, and school leaving. And that's really important to know, because you, there's a literature that's saying, well, school leaving, early school leaving leads to adult incarceration. Well, yes, but that horse is bolted, because actually what precedes the early school leaving is their engagement in delinquency. So once they've been arrested, as an adult, I mean, they've already committed to a path. So a discussion about the effect of education on incarceration to me seems to be, well, yes, but that horse is bolted. Let's, we need to move back, step back and look at the big picture. These are cumulative starting probabilities and the point to take from this um, graph is that this, this top line is looking at the probability at, at each age of having, uh, or the proportion of the population who have engaged in an activity. So it shows, for example, uh, at age 14, close to 50%, is that 14, 50% uh, have engaged in um, delinquency. Um, so what you, you see is, um, here's your, your um, non-income generating delinquency, and you can see that that's sort of levelling off by the time you get to, I don't know, 20-ish. So that suggests that the people, there's, no one, there's not really many people making the transition into that kind of crime after age, I don't know, 20, for example. So if you're not, if you're not going to be in it by 20, the probability of, of adult onset is quite small. Similarly, the income generating crime, you can see that that levels off at about 44%, um, you know, around 20. So you can see the probability of making that transition into income generating crime very small after 20. So this suggests types, right? People who are highly susceptible to income generating crime, highly susceptible to um, non-income generating crime. So maybe that's a, so there's a, a different, you know, unobserved heterogeneity types, and you have to take that into account in modelling. Here's arrest, it levels off at about 44 or 42%. Uh, it's not as clear that that's gone flat. Um, um, and here's school leaving. A lot of school leaving happens here, so that suggests there might be types in school leaving, those who are going to go on and those who are going to struggle to finish year 12. Um, not to belabor the point, but this is just putting in a table the order of events. So you can see um, delinquency, the proportion of the sample who commit delinquency before leaving school, 63%. Those who commit delinquency after leaving school, 3%. Those who are arrested before leaving school, 26.8%. Those who are arrested after leaving school, 13%. So hopefully I've convinced you that there's, just if you look at the timing of, of when things happen, there's a lot of information in there and it should help you think about these processes or help policymakers think about these processes. Now, that's descriptive. I want to know what the, what is, you know, what the effect of these um, choice variables are of delinquency and the outcome of their choice, which is being arrested, how it impacts on school leaving. The strategy I'm going to employ is a, a multivariate mixed proportional hazard. And the idea is we model those transitions, all those lines as separate processes. We have an equation for each one of them. And they're estimated as a system. Each one of them has an unobserved heterogeneity to allow for those types, those susceptible or vulnerable and those who are not. And that follows a, has a joint distribution and that allows for correlation in unobservables. So in our baseline specification, we're going to allow both delinquency and arrest to affect school leaving and we're going to allow the unobserved heterogeneity terms in the three processes to be correlated. So I'm trying to keep it reasonably simple and straightforward. In a sensitivity analysis, we go whole hog and we allow for reverse causality. So we allow for school leaving to have a direct impact on uh, transitions into delinquency and into arrest. Even though the data doesn't suggest there's a big case for it, I need to make sure I can rule that out as um, undoing my interpretation as causal. You probably don't need to know about proof of identification. And this is where you take your nap if you don't care for a, um, statistical analysis. So we're using, um, so what I'm going to do is give you a baby example. I'm going to talk about a two equation system which kind of neat, fits neatly with the literature which is just looking at the effect of arrest on school leaving. Um, so the primary thing I'm interested in is school leaving. So I'm going to model the hazard for school leaving at time t 
And it's going to depend on uh, a baseline hazard, like just the age dependency. Uh, there's different risks of school leaving, you know, at age 18 and 19, then at 24 or at 15, because there are, you know, big exit points on the freeway of school leaving. Uh, so that is a, that's a canopy with duration dependence, and we just model it flexibly with a step function, so there's no functional form restrictions there. The second part is where you put in all of your observable um, uh, confounders, the things that you observe that you know are going to affect school leaving, so parent, parents' education, ability, um, brothers and sisters, because that affects household resources. And also, I have an indicator for having previously been arrested, arrest in a previous period. I'm quite careful about this. If you're arrested in the same period as you leave school, I can't tell what happened first. So I'm going to be very conservative and say only arrest that precedes school leaving can have a causal impact. And that's what's picking up there. So the, the parameter of interest is going to be delta A, which is the effect of prior, prior arrest on school leaving in the current period. Now, the final term, the little V term, it's just exponentiated to make sure it's positive, is the unobserved heterogeneity. So it's going to allow for discrete types. So we're going to use a discrete distribution of, of types. Um, in all of the models um, for school leaving and arrest and the two kinds of delinquency, you'll have two types, high risk, low risk, or high susceptibility, low susceptibility. And then you can just put the hazard together with a survivor to get the probability of making a transition at time t. And as I mentioned, incomplete durations are just treated as censored, so they just enter with a survivor function component. So here, here's a picture. So the idea is that if you're arrested at time period um, uh, A, which should, then you, it will lead to an increase in your hazard. This is your hazard of leaving school. So being arrested just leads to a, a jump in the hazard and that stays constant for all future periods. I mean, you can look at allowing for age or time, different effects that go for different lengths of time, but that's just the simplest specification. Of course, I have to have a hazard rate for arrest, so I model arrest depending, which uh, has duration dependence, which is just, once again, modeled flexibly, non-parametrically with a step function. I've got the same control variables as I had in my school leaving equation, and I have unobserved heterogeneity um, in the model for um, the hazard for exiting, uh, well, for making the transition to arrest. Now, what's really important is I think the unobserved heterogeneity that determines school leaving might also determine arrest. So I've got a V in one equation and epsilon in another equation. I want them to be drawn from a joint distribution that allows them to be correlated, doesn't impose independence in that joint distribution. So if I have two types for uh, arrest, high and low risk, two types for school leaving, high and, and low risk. When I put them together, I have four types. High, 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 low, low, high, low, low. So I have uh, up to four types, which I attempt to uh, identify in the data empirically, um, uh, also not assuming any um, distribution, it's just a discrete mass point. So you... Um, when I want to add delinquency, if I want to also look at the effect of delinquency on school leaving, then what that means is I first of all have an equation for delinquency, like the transition, uptake of delinquency, and I have another shifter in, addition, in the school leaving equation. In addition to having the shifter for being arrested, I also have the shifter for delinquency. So I have prior delinquency in entering the school leaving equation. Okay, so what I'm going to do now... <laughs> I'm going to take off my jacket. Right, so now I'm getting into the results. Now, we just did all that heavy lifting going through what the, the modelling is, the statistical modelling. So now I get to show you some results. And the first set of results I'm going to show you are the ones that correspond to the simple model that sort of fits neatly with the literature, which looks at the effect of arrest on school leaving, because that's been the focus of the literature. So I can do that in a simple bivariate framework. And then I'll build up to the baseline model, which adds the effect of delinquency, so that's a trivariate system. And then I'm going to do some sensitivity analysis, which includes looking at um, school leaving causing uh, or leading to delinquency and arrest. Uh, I can look at the effect of delinquency on the probability of, of transition rate into arrest. I can look at differential effects of the income and non-income generating crime. And at the end, I've got some simulations that give you hard and fast numbers. I might just use the words. Use your words, Jenny, use your words. <laughs> Okay, first and foremost, well, the first thing to note is the unobserved heterogeneity term is correlated. So as you would suspect, things that make you vulnerable to uh, arrest make you vulnerable to school leaving, right? These are people who are disadvantaged. 
Um, we identify three out of four potential types. So we get the high susceptibility for, for uh, school leaving and high susceptibility for arrest. We get high susceptibility for school leaving and low susceptibility for arrest, low susceptibility for school leaving and low susceptibility for arrest. We don't get a low susceptibility for school leaving. These are people going on doing masters and PhDs with um, a high um, susceptibility to arrest. And that kind of makes sense. There aren't too many people who are doing masters and PhDs who get getting arrested. Okay, so that, that's okay. I can live with that. You always have to have these, you know, like the sniff test. Does it make sense? Yeah, uh, it's fine to have very complicated models, but at the end of the day, does it make sense? So here's the headline result. After accounting for correlated unobserved heterogeneity, um, arrest increases school leaving by about 52%. So that's at each age. Um, if you don't account for the unobserved heterogeneity that's correlated, you get a much bigger number, 82%. And this indicates that there's po positive correlation, which is what you anticipate. So basically, these results accord with previous ones. There's nothing funky going on in these data. And my estimation strategy isn't giving me weird results. It's all very, it's all very lined up with previous work. But I want to do things that people haven't done before. I want to look at the effect of delinquency. And the reason I want to look at the effect of delinquency is whether or not you get caught, you're spending time engaging in an activity, and it's going to change the way that you, your, you view your choices. You're engaging in an activity, you're investing in it, you're getting skills in it, and it's going to trade, change the trade-off between school and crime. So I imagine that the change in the relative rewards to those activities is going to manifest itself with different behaviour in terms of school leaving. Uh, so once again, the unobserved uh, heterogeneity is found to be correlated. So it's really important to take this into account. We, we can identify six of the eight types. Um, uh, after accounting for correlated unobserved heterogeneity, we find that delinquency increases the school leaving rate by 31% and that uh, arrest increases the school re re leaving rate by 57%. Oh, sorry, I don't know. Ooh. Oops. Uh, mm. Oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, so the, effect of, the impact of arrest on school leaving is twice the impact of delinquency on school leaving, which you know, can make sense. There's uh, less uh, stigma attached to delinquency if people don't know about it at school, and, and so you don't have to worry about that effect um, way that the teachers view you and your peers view you. Um, so we know that both delinquency and arrest affect school leaving. So now what I want to do is say, okay, let's dig deeper. What about if we account for reverse causality? What about if we account for the fact that delinquency uh, has, should have a causal effect on arrest, which I haven't put in the model yet? And what about if we look at different kinds of crime and different ages of, of initiation? I might do it this way. Um, so first of all, when we look at reverse causality, the literature says, so everyone basically leaves. We look at people up to age 30. People leave school by age 30. So it's not leaving school that really matters for our for what we're looking at, we're looking at early school leaving. So I distinguish between early school leaving, which is before 17, that means you're not going to be finishing year 12. And then I think there's also, you know, there can be these critical or salient ages, 18, 19, when you're on the cusp of leaving school, because if you got into trouble then and you were suspended, you might not go back and finish school. So I separate them out, age 18, 19, and then uh, late uh, school leaving is um, after, so 20 and older. Now, this, these results are really interesting um, to me. <laughs> so we find that the onset of delinquency, it doesn't matter what age, it never... Um, oh, it's really funny. I, I can't relate to words. I've got to look at the numbers. Um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> when I get excited, you know. Um, so in terms of onset of delinquency, it doesn't matter what... Age, so there's no stars. An absence of stars means no statistical significant effect. There's no effect of onset... Uh, of early school leaving on delinquency. So leaving school does not lead to delinquency. But what we do find, I'm sorry, I'm just going to get, I'm a bit excited, right? So I have to use my, use my numbers again. I've got it in words on the next page. We'll talk about magnitudes. But arrest, early arrest, so early arrest, which is uh, up to age 17, uh, or mid-arrest, that's got stars. So that means it does affect uh, school leaving. Being arrested does affect uh, school leaving. I'm sorry, what am I saying? Uh, that's being arrested affects school leaving and delinquency affects school leaving, but what we're concentrating on here is school leaving leading to arrest. So we find delinquency doesn't lead to arrest, but school leaving, well, not if you're 20 or older, but if you're like 15, 16, 17, big impact, even 18, 19 has an impact. 
And we thought, wow, that's really, why, could, why would that be the case? So we, oh, I, well, so I probably should go through, I'm getting, I get excited. <laughs> so let me, so I should just back up and talk about magnitude so you get a sense of the size of what we're finding. So as I said, Early school leaving doesn't lead to delinquency, but early school leaving increases the transition rate into first arrest by 164%, and school leaving at age 18 or 19 increases the transition rate into first arrest by 43%. Now, we thought, well, how, how can that be? Uh, why is it the delinqu onset of de um, school leaving didn't lead to the onset of delinquency, but school leaving did lead to the onset of arrest? So we kind of looked at the data and cut it up a bit, and what we found is that... Um, if you look at people um, pre and post arrest, you can look for a, a, a subset. So I couldn't do analysis, but for a subset, you can collect data. You can see the number of crimes they committed before arrest and after arrest, and you see that, um, that their intensity of, of um, offending increases after arrest. And also, you can look at the value of, of the crime in terms of stolen property. That also increases after, uh, after arrest. So it seems that arrest increases... Um, um, sorry, after school leaving. So we looked, sorry, we cut at school leaving and we looked at their um, offending behaviour before and after. So we saw that um, it didn't... So what happens is that early school leaving doesn't lead you to be delinquent, but amongst those who are delinquent, they start offending more intensely, more numbers of crime, and more severely. So the dollar value is worth more. If you look at before, you compare before and after school leaving, the kinds of crimes that they're self-reporting, you can see that it's increased their intensity and severity of offending. So that's I thought was quite interesting, very exciting. Um, it's also important to note that when we account for reverse causality, it doesn't it doesn't impact the magnitude of our estimates for um, uh, um, for the effect of a delinquency uh, on school leaving, and it only has a tiny effect magnitudinally on the effect of arrest um, on school leaving. So that tells us if we don't. Um, don't go forward with this very complicated um, model where everything's going in both directions. There's no loss um, information in terms of the policy question we're trying to address. Uh, we also look at the eff effect of delinquency on arrest because that wasn't encaptured in the model because you try and get it down to the bare bones but then you try and say, OK, I've got something stable going on. What if I add this bell? What about this whistle? So this whistle uh, is about um, looking at the probability of um, uh, how the transition into arrest is affected by delinquency. And once again, we distinguish between different ages, early, mid or late. Uh, early delinquency is by age 15, mid 16 or 17, late 18, and that's guided by looking at those transition rates we were looking at before. And what we find is the early onset of delinquency increases the transition rate into arrest by 156% compared to late onset, so compared to onset at age 18 or older. If you start delinquency at 16 or 17, it increases the probability of arrest by 51% compared to someone who starts at age 18 and older, and those who don't engage in delinquency are 85% less likely to be arrested compared to someone who initiates later, which is also very reassuring. In the data, we observe people who say they've been arrested, who say they haven't engaged in delinquency. Uh, and, this is, and this is reflected in the data. I think there are false arrests, so there you go. But importantly, accounting for the effect of delinquency on arrest leads uh, only to a small reduction in the magnitude of the, effect, of the estimates of the effect of delinquency uh, on uh, school leaving and arrest on school leaving. So the main findings are uh, unaltered by this particular whistle bell. So we, we're going to leave this uh, complication here and move on. Now, you know, you might not buy the interpretation, but you might still be interested in the results that follow. The human capital model has two predictions with regards to what we're looking at today. The first is that income generating crime should have a much bigger effect on school leaving than non-income generating crime. And that early onset uh, should have bigger impact impact than later onset because you've made a greater investment in, in human capital so you expect a higher relative return. So we might leave that there, <laughs> see if I can remain calm and we can use my words. Um, so first of all, we just allow for, we've now, we'll now expand our system to four system, four equations, non-income generating crime, income generating crime, arrest and school leaving. And income generating crime can have a separate effect than from non-income generating crime in the transition out of school. And so what we find is that income generating uh, delinquency increases the transition rate out of school by 41%. And it's, you know, three stars, hugely significant. 
The non-income generated, which means significant at the 1%, sorry, <laughs> significant at the 1%, highly significant. Non-income generating delinquency increases the transition rate out of school by 10% and it's got like one star. So it's significant at the 10% level. So it's weak in terms of significance and small in terms of magnitude. Uh, arrest increases the transition rate out of school by uh, 49%. So that's sort of the same sort of magnitude as we were getting before we differentiated the different kinds of crime. So this suggests that the effect of uh, delinquency on school leaving is driven by income generating delinquency. And in fact, it's the magnitude of the effect is actually now similar to that of arrest. Right, so then we want to look at age of onset. So we have age of onset of income generating delinquency, age of onset of non-income generating delinquency, and age of onset of arrest. This is now a very, very, very complicated model. Um, we're going to look at the effect of early, mid or late uh, onset of income and non-income generating delinquency. And uh, we've kept... So what we find is that... Um, I, really, I really want to look at my numbers and my stars. I can feel the excitement building again. Income generating delinquency, early onset has a larger effect um, on school leaving, 45% increase than mid. This is just delinquency, not getting arrested, right? 45% uh, increase in the transition rate out of schooling amongst those who are still in school at each age. Mid, 33%, uh, and late, 38%. Um, so you are seeing bigger effects at younger ages. 16 or 17 doesn't seem to be that vulnerable, but once you get to the 18 and older, there does look like there's this vulnerability um, uh, when you're, you know, if you get caught at, you know, at school and get in trouble for something at 18 or 19, um, you know, stealing someone's lunch money or something. It does, you know, if you're suspended, you just might not come back because you not you can't graduate with your class. It does seem that there's a little bit of a kick uh, towards the end of their finishing year 12 or high school. Uh, arrest, early onset, has a larger effect of school... Oh, I didn't do the non-income generating crime. It only has an effect for the late onset, 18 or older, and it increases the school leaving rate by 30%. So this is, you know, when kids get into to fights, uh, you know, when they're older and get suspended, that same story. If you get suspended towards the end of your schooling, you might not come back. Uh, you're nearly finished. You've had it with the teachers. They always pick on you. And, um, and so it does seem to be an effect there that's quite sizable. Uh, um, in terms of arrest, early onset has a larger effect on the rate of school leaving than mid and um, late has no effect on, on school leaving. So basically the evidence seems to be um, consistent with an income generating, uh, the human capital model of, of, of crime. Um, in terms of the non-income generating crime, there does look like there's some uh, salient story or critical life cycle, uh, crit critical periods in the life cycle uh, going on there. Okay. So now we come to the simulations. So I talked about increases in transition rates, but we don't really think in terms of policy in terms of transition rates. We think of, well, what, what, what proportion are leaving school? You know, there was this percent, and now a bunch have left, and so what is the percent who are, have left school because they're engaged in delinquency? So this is what the simulations are designed to do. I've given... I'm going to just focus on the first couple of columns. Uh, the base case is someone who, uh, who does not engage in delinquency and does not, is not arrested. And so this is what pro um, it's the probability of, of school leaving. So this is telling you what proportion or what percent have left school at each age. So age 14, everyone's at school. Age 25, no one's at school. This column here is looking at people who are delinquent at age 16. That's the simulations this particular case. This column is for people who are delinquent but not arrested, and this is the column for people who were delinquent and arrested. So let's look at this. Make a, if we compare someone at age 18 who's um, not been arrested, not engaged in delinquency, 35% have left school, or 35% chance of that individual having left school. Or if you look at his cohort of 18-year-olds, 35% of that cohort of 18-year-olds have left school. No delinquency, no arrest. If you look at the cohort, if you separate the cohort into, and focus on those who've engaged in delinquency um, uh, at age 16 or by age 16, but have not been arrested, 42% have left school. So you can in see the increase in school leaving at this age is uh, 7%. 7 percentage points. I'm sorry, 7 percentage points. 7 over 35 is much bigger than 7%. <laughs> 7 percentage points. And then if the person has been arrested at age 17, uh, um, um, probability of leaving school, of having left school by age 18 is 55%. 
So you can see embedded in this is the uh, going from here to here is 7 and then going from here to here is 13. So you can see that the rest is having twice the impact of delinquency, but this allows you to put some you know, kind of numbers on it to see what, um, what proportion of people are left school uh, under different scenarios. So that's, um, so that's, that's what this says. But, so then if you want to look at what's the societal impact, you have to look at the proportion of people who are, uh, who are actually, we want to multiply the, you know, these effects, 13%, 7%. Uh, you want to multiply these effects by the proportion at risk in each category. And when we looked in our data, oh, I didn't put the actual numbers. Oh, wait. Here we go. The percentage of the sample who are still in school at age 17 and ever been delinquent but not arrested is 36%. Uh, those who have ever been arrested and still at school at age 17 is only 17%. So you can see that if you, in terms of, want to work out the uh, net impact to society in terms of school leaving, you apply the coefficients to the relevant population and you see that there, the net impact to, to society is the same from delinquency as it is from arrest. Good. Oh, wrapping up. Wrapping up. Five minutes. Excellent. Um, um, so this, this has been very dense. There's a lot in here, but I was very excited to share it with you. And I, I think that it's really important because all the empirical literature I could focus on was focusing on criminal justice interactions. And it seems to me that there's a lot of people who do naughty things who aren't get, being caught. And um, theory and more than two minutes of thinking about it suggests that they're engaging in that naughty behaviour is changing the way they make trade-offs and make, they make decisions, in particular with regards to school leaving. So we empirically investigate the idea that delinquency can have an impact on school leaving, even amongst those who aren't arrested. And we do so also accounting for the fact that some people are arrested and accounting for the impact of arrest on their school leaving behaviour. And our key findings are that after accounting for common unobserved confounders and reverse causality, both arrest and delinquency increase the rate of school leaving. And on the basis of the estimates, we calculate the societal impact of delinquency and arrest are in fact similar. So this suggests that perhaps there needs, you know, a focus only on people that come in contact with the criminal justice system is to be missing half of the problem because early school leaving uh, has shown to be causally related to adult crime and criminality. Our more detailed analysis revealed the effect of delinquency on school leaving is being driven by offences that are income generating and that early initiation into income generating has a larger effect on school leaving than uh, later initiation. And it's predicted by, by theory. Now, in terms of policy implications, as I sort of already alluded to, having um, a juvenile justice or criminal justice approach is kind of narrow because you're missing half of the potential, half of the, a large proportion of people who are at risk um, of, of adult um, crime and uh, incarceration. Um, now, I suspect that while juvenile justice might not know much about these people, their teachers and their principals do. So it seems to me that school-based interventions uh, would be um, well-placed because they would know the children who are... Uh, whose who's behaviour... Um, they might not know whether they're delinquent, but they'd have a pretty good idea who's at risk. And in Chicago, there's a Chicago crime lab and they're doing some amazing, amazing work. And they're looking at all kinds of programs that are school-based. Um, that it's not, it's not, you don't have to be, you just have to be at risk, identified at risk to be part of the program. And a lot of them actually involve cognitive behaviour therapy. How to react to someone standing like that. You don't punch them or knife them. I mean, what is, what is an appropriate response? So it, it actually has um, a lot of different kind of life skill things about how you interact with people. Uh, because they have a very sort of defensive, aggressive kind of response to the world, um, you know, through the neighbourhoods and dodging bullets and whatever, you know, Chicago. So, you know, they, they come, they bring all this to school with them and they have to really be taught uh, uh, different responses. Now, they're also taken out of, school, uh, out of classes and they have, um, you know, they get extra tutoring, but that's, that's part of it. But it's school-based and it's about teaching them how to interact, survive and, and thrive in the school school system and that seems to be have, having really um, promising, promising results. So I guess the sort of the bottom line is that, um, that uh, I mean, once you, you know, it's a bit late after they left school because you kind of know what path they're on. Get them while they're in school and don't wait for them to be arrested.
Thanks a lot, Jenny. So um, we've got some time for questions now. If I can open up to the floor, maybe just down here, our Judy, we've got a question down the front here. both define and identify um, what you considered to be arrest and delinquency, the two different types of delinquency, income generating and non-income generating? Yeah, with arrest, they self-report arrest, but I don't know if it, for what they were arrested, I just know if they were arrested. So it's self-reported. In terms of um, uh, the... the um, whether it's income or non-income generating, when they're asked about delinquency, and that's the word that's used in the survey, not crime, it's delinquency, um, they are asked, did you, um, well, first of all, what age did you first do this, the first wave? Subsequent waves, they're asked, I'm just trying to find where I've actually, uh, here, here we go, um, <laughs> pointing at the wrong thing, ah! So they're actually asked to enumerate, you know, since the last survey, have you engaged in stealing something worth $50 or more, including a car? Have you... So these are separate questions. So they answer each question um, separately. So that's how we can divide things into income and non-income generating crime. We don't in separate them into property and offences and offences against the person. All right. So delinquency is criminal activity that was not resulting in arrest. No, no, no. Just did you engage in this activity? And then a separate question is... Were you arrested since the last survey? Or, and yeah. was there any guidance given to the respondents as to what you considered arrest to be, whether it was temporary detention or whether it led to legal process? I think, you know, I think in the US it's pretty clear, you know, if you've been arrested. Yeah, but the police can arrest someone for the purpose of inquiries or returning them back to their parents, um, right through to putting them before the courts. Um, I know if they were incarcerated, so we, they just, they're asked, yeah, I'm not too sure, I don't, I don't know, it seemed, yeah, we, I'm not too sure, I think uh, they seem to know what arrest means. Um, I didn't, yeah, I should look at the survey instrument to be able to answer that more clearly. Yeah, it's just that that can be very much open to interpretation, what arrest actually is. People filling out paperwork on you, I think, yeah. Okay. Jenny, this is slightly a tangential question in relation to the self-reporting data on delinquency. You now have a very rich database of self-reporting activity. Uh, I know it sounds like it's a bit outside of what you were doing here, but do you now uh, have some indication of how much delinquency in these US data that's not being reported um, by official data? Oh, that's not tangential at all. In fact, someone else has a paper on it. So um, <laughs> uh, Lance Lockmere has he's looked at um, this, this survey, I think, or the 79 one, I'm not sure now. Uh, there's lots of papers that have looked at this. And they do find, um, you know, there are issues around um, self-reporting and, and race and things like that. But when he compares it to official statistics, he sort of thinks that, um, you know, concludes that it's, I mean, people don't, um, it's, it's, a quite, it's a very strong source because people under-report crimes that have been committed against them uh, and, and felt that this was very useful and, and reliable data. Um, but he was more looking around the issue of how to compare to official statistics to sort of gauge um, under-reporting or over-reporting and things like that. Um, yeah, so I could give you the reference to that paper, but I haven't tried to extrapolate. Because I'm not in the US, I don't have geocode data, so I don't even know what state the people reside in. I just have five, you know, Midwest, you know, South kind of aggregate regions, and I know if they're urban or um, rural or, you know, suburbia. So I couldn't, I wouldn't be able to do that exercise because I, as a, someone who's not at a US university, don't have uh, the specific geocodes. So I couldn't pursue it, but people have sort of looked around that question in the US that have access to that data. Hi, Jenny. I was just a bit puzzled by the ages in your data. Uh, I would have imagined people at 18 would have been finishing school and leaving school for that reason, but you seem like that seemed to be not the case here. What, how, how did you handle someone who leaves school at 18 having finished grade 12? Were they treated as just leaving school? Well, that's why we have a baseline hazard which is very flexible to account for the fact that there are natural exits on the, you know, 
So you can have a big... So that's different from a causal... So that's in the um, baseline hazard. You, uh, uh, but are you, are you including uh, tertiary education in here? Yeah, or? yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh. Education is, is okay. you know, I the took whole school to mean school, sorry. That's yeah, no, I should have... I did put it on the slide, but I didn't actually say it. Uh, sorry. Yeah, defined as primary, secondary, tertiary. Got it. Yeah. Don? I think Don had a question. Did you not? No. Uh, yeah, great. Um, in the data set, the two confounders that predict that there are two confounders which loom really large. May well have been in the data set. One's a measure of cognitive ability. Um, education of parents gets something of that, but it's not perfect. And the other one is um, ethnic background or race, which really has a huge impact on outcomes in these things. I wonder if there were specific effects you found in your model in regard to those things. So we controlled in the, the part of the model, you know, there's a duration dependence, unobserved heterogeneity, and then the bit that has all the Xs. So the bit that has the Xs has um, race being um, black, Hispanic, and not black and not Hispanic. Mm. And we've explored differential effects uh, around that. Uh, I didn't put it in the talk because of time reasons, because there is some concern that um, blacks in particular differentially report. So um, I think, I think the, uh, the upshot is that there's, if there is differential reporting, because there does seem to be some differential effects, that what we're showing, what I showed you is by main results, my baseline, that's a lower, it would be a lower um, level estimate. The, the true effect could be larger. And so um, we do account for arrest and, you know, yes, of course, you know, the race variables have the expected signs and are significant in all the equations. Um, in terms of ability, there's, I can't remember what the acronym is, I mean, you might know, but it's this um, armed services vocational, I don't know, it's some ability test, there's math, there's a bunch of different components to it, maths and English and I don't know, social science, I can't remember what the components are. We use the aggregate that adds them all up, but what we do is we remove the effect of schooling, there's some standard ways in the literature to do that, so we're trying to separate out their performance on this ability test from their schooling. It seems to me that there'd be a good reason to expect people performing really poorly on the ability test are much more likely to be involved in delinquency and much more likely yes. subsequently not to complete yes, schooling. Yes, and that's why it's so important to control for it, yes, because we don't want to confound the effect of um, being low ability with the effect of delinquency or arrest, which is, so if you control for it, that means you've taken it out. So that's what, yep, yeah, that's what we do. So the effect that we find is holding ability constant, this is the effect of arrest and this is the effect of delinquency. Be interested. The question, I suppose, is, is that much more powerful than the effects that you've shown us in the talk? Uh, are they more powerful? Um, well, we've standardised it. The, the test is... Stan we've standardised it. So, you know, we can talk about what a, the impact of a standard deviation increase is and things like that. Uh, but it's not sort of the focus. But we could look at it more carefully and compare magnitudes. Often, when you don't have something naturally to compare things to, you, yeah. Yeah, you, you would do that, yeah. Um, well, we might... Oh, Jenny. OK, we've, Jenny, it's got one quick question and then we might leave it there. Thank you. Um, I'm just wondering how applicable these results are in Australia, where the policymakers can take anything from a study of, of US data. Um, and I guess a related question is the AOFS is doing the longitudinal study of Australian children, Australian Institute of Family Studies, I LSAC. think. Yeah, no, AIFS. Yes, the, 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 yeah. the, long, the LSAC, LSAC study. Yeah. Yeah. Are you thinking of, of replicating the study using some of those results? I think the people in LSAC are only about seven or something in the current data. So, are they? Are they? Are they 14 or 15? Yeah. Oh, wow. Well, no, that would be great. That would be great. Um, LSAC is a really, 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 really rich data set. But I've been kind of... You know, the, I'm interested in sort of um, risky behaviours that are more um, teenagerhood orientated. I know there's two cohorts. I thought that the publicly released data that was still a bit on the young side, um, but it's on my to-do list, and I am changing my focus to be kind of more um, Australian orientated as the data become available. But we don't have anything like this. So if you want to ask the questions, you have to look at well, where can I? What data can I source to ask the questions? And I just got annoyed reading literature that. I thought missed the big picture. So, and my PhD students used to saying, we're like, oh. <laughs> 
So we wanted to get out there and ask the questions that we thought were important, and these were the best data available to do it, and they're incredibly rich, and they're free to anyone. So you've got you to say, you've got to thank the Americans for that. It's just fantastic. Now, in terms of applicability, so let me say this. The incarceration rate, you know, per, was it 1,000 adults in the population? is about 500 in the US, and it's close to 200 in Australia. Australia really ranks right. You know, we don't... There's, there's not too many people in between Australia and America. We really rank right up there in terms of incarcerating people. And when... I think one of the distinctions between the US and Australia is our welfare system. And when they were talking about policies where if you don't apply for this many jobs, and then they were looking at people in Tasmania with no education, never had a job, had families, I got very, very nervous. Because I thought, well, that brings us very much into line. Because, you know, there's, if you take that away, what are the alternatives? Um, so the defining feature in my mind is for people who are at risk is that we have a welfare system. Uh, and once you... Once you start um, saying, you've got no education, you've never had a job, and you're never going to have a job, and if you can't apply for three jobs every week, you're not going to get um, any welfare support, then I really, I really worried, well, what's going to happen to these people? I thought I could draw a pretty straight line. I knew exactly where they'd end up, and I knew it wasn't going to be a cost-saving measure uh, introducing this policy. Uh, thanks so much. I hope everyone can join me in thanking Jenny. She's been a great contribution to the debate.